exploring the functionality of retinal cells and circuits um, through a number of, of different uh, processes. So uh, thank you very much. And we're really excited to hear from you. Sure. Um, can you see my screen now? Perfect. So thank you for the introduction, Philippa, and I'm thankful to be here and having me here today. And my name is Zohre Hossain Zadeh, a group leader of the Cell Biology of Vision at Radboud UMC Netherlands. I am uh, here as a representative of the live science panel. And uh, in particular, I was in LS5 for neuroscience and diseases. So uh, first, when I wanted to start to apply for ERC, I asked actually myself uh, why achieving an ERC is important. Actually, ERC, offer independence, recognition, and visibility, and to know on a research topic of your own research and with a team of the scientists to gain true financial autonomy for five years to negotiate with the housing situation, the best condition of the work. Maria spoke about that, Angela, to attract top team members in Europe or non-Europe countries and collaborator and to move with the grant to any place in the Europe, if necessary, to promote actually, and attract also additional fund and gain recognition. And remember that ERC uh, equal, uh, quality label. So next, uh, I ask, what can I write actually, and how should I shape my idea, which is really important. And I was thinking that I should propose uh, what I should propose for this uh, uh, call. And then I I try to think, and I think that we should propose a frontier research from basic research to apply science and multiple and interdisciplinary proposal which cross boundaries between different fields of the research and address new topics by merging field of the research. And of course, introducing unconventional and innovative approaches and scientific inventions. What I did that actually, I try actually to merge field of the research to shape my idea at that time. So I will tell you next how I did that. So during my scientific journey, I have been in the different uh, research uh, uh, stations and from uh, neuroscience and uh, designing electronic device, stem cell, and uh, computational neuroscience. And then I was thinking, OK, um, what approach I have learned till now? And then I see that I have a, I know that biomarker of disease in the retina and vision technology, like a multi-electrode array. And also, I learned uh, more about the a different uh, aspect of the stem cell derived organoid. That's why I started to shape my idea about ERC. Next also, I ask uh, this question about my idea that um, does it really this idea promise to go substantially beyond the state of the art? Is it timely? Why is, uh, uh, wasn't it feasible in the past? Uh, what make it feasible now? What is the risk? And do I have a plan for managing the risk? Why is my proposal project significant and important? And also I ask myself, why am I the best and only person can do this uh, project? And also, um, uh, okay. And am I internationally competitive as a researcher at my career stage and at my disciplinary? Am I able to work independently and manage a five years project? And when I asked this question, I was convinced also myself that yes, I am the right person. I wrote my idea as I told you about merging different research I have done, research I have done in the past. And then um, the aim was 
generating a functional human retinal organoid uh, as a model uh, to serve for retinal diseases, which at the end was funded and granted. And uh, today I'm trying to walk you through the, my experiences from a uh, starting application till interview and uh, funded grant and granted the project. Uh, first, I try to understand what is the purposal structure, because this is really important to know the structure. So we have a part B1, uh, should be submitted as a PDF, and it is extended synopsis, five pages, and uh, very important to put everything in these five pages and CV and early achievements record, which is four pages, and B2, also should submit it as a PDF. Um, it's a scientific proposal, 15 pages. You should write about the state of the art, your objective and methodology. And in parallel, you should also prepare, and I try to familiar with that, part A, which is online form. A1 is proposal information. A2 is hosting situation, PI information, budget, ethic issues, and quality specific information. And then you have annexes. Uh, which um, compose of the HI support letter, copy of the PhD certificate, documents for extension of eligibility windows. So then I also try to understand the re review procedure for ERC SDG because uh, it's really necessary to know that, that to prepare for each steps in parallel. And I understood, and now you learn also in the in the previous talk that we have two steps. Step one, uh, the section uh, one, uh, which uh, um, will be or is uh, evaluated by panel member remotely, and the B one part is really important at that stage. And then if you pass and you can get the score A, then you can go to the S step two which um, your full proposal means part B1 and P2 uh, are evaluated, and then uh, the applicants uh, are invited for interview, and then the proposal uh, are ranked, and then uh, also scored. So then I started, when I, I got myself familiar with all, uh, all uh, information, I started to write and uh, I want to talk first about part B1 and then part P2. So part B1 uh, is necessary for a step one. Panel members see only part B1 of the proposal at the step one. So it is really important this part because if you cannot pass B1, you cannot go to the next step. So then pay, I paid particular attention to this part, to be to have a groundbreaking nature of the research project, check all the state of the art, and then also write beyond this that. And I am trying to think big. That's really important. And know my competitors is really important and help me. What is the state of the play? And what is my idea and significant approach outstanding? So I try to write the one concise, clear, present my idea and also uh, in, you should be careful that evaluator may not uh, from your field. That's why you need to write very clear and simple. So I made a short session and uh, for example, why this approach is really important. I even put some preliminary result to help also that, that the reviewer that, that I know and I started to learn about this project. I bullet the important points to help the reader and referees to find the important part. I outline the methodology approach, like work packages, but not all because B1 is really five pages. And just I try to put some packages, but not all. I wrote also my the feasibility assessment of the project and also personals, like um, who uh, does what and show also my scientific independence in my CV. At that time, a narrative CV was not uh, the case, but I wrote biography, like what I did in the past and each stage and why I want to propose this idea and where is my niche. Also, I show my outreach, outreach activity, workshop or congress, which, which I 
organize. And also this is important, the part B1, select the right panel. That's really important because then, then uh, the, 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 the expert uh, reviews your, your, your project. Then I prepare also part two, actually in parallel, of course. Um, and in the section, uh, step two, B1 and B2 are read, read. And then by panel and of course by remove ref referees. This is important. Do not just repeat this uh, synopsis. I try to rewrite the um, B1 and don't repeat again the all words and all things uh, from B1. And also provide a state of the art, explains all my hypotheses, and provide family data. And also I provide detail on the, my methodology. I wrote first rational, background, work plan, and previous result or previous publication related uh, to this, uh, because this shows that my expertise uh, related to that part. And um, we have a 15 pages and references are not uh, are excluded from this page limit. That's why we have enough space to show that. And then provide also alternative strategy to mitigate risk. That's very, very important. I use a lot of graphic workflows, uh, figure chart to help to guide referees to understand the topic and the, the concept. And also I explain involvement of the team members, PhD, postdoc, say that the, the postdoc have a, this ex, has a, this expertise, uh, can do this and that. And with this, uh, I show that also I know who uh, I am going to hire. And uh, show also the need of the collaboration. That's really important because you yourself cannot do everything and you cannot be expert on everything. And also with that, you show that you recognize nationally and internationally. Also, um, just some tip about preparation and submission. I check previous ERC grants on my topic or related topic that help me to see different examples. And I start B1 and B2 at the same time. Please don't start only B1 because uh, you may lose the time because B2 is really large, you know, 15 pages. And I also, in the meanwhile, also I try to speak with the uh, ERC artists, get also feedback from them about the experiences. And I started to register early in the protocol and get familiar with the system template and start to fill in the form slowly, meanwhile. And also I talk to my institution grant office to give a feedback uh, to my different drafts and also national contact who has uh, also uh, expert to give you feedback. So I download then um, the, 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 the draft uh, and also in the portal and then I check and proofread the purpose of before submission. Um, the portal is not reliable actually, but, and especially by deadline. That's why you need always check and again submit. So submitting proposal, um, submitted proposal can revise until call deadline by submitting a new version. And again, you can rewrite, modify, and then the previous version. I ask always my colleague and friends and collaborators for proofreading during this uh, process. Next, I was uh, invited for interview. An interview and was I was really excited, happy, but also like like I need to prepare and then you you don't get any feedback uh, from referees at that that stage, and only I receive detail on my interview and I read it very read it carefully. It was a ten minute presentation, twenty minutes question uh, and um, ask and question, and also the interview was online. So I started to prepare for, for, for interview. I try in my presentation, make my own story, how I started and what I wanted to do, showing some uh, proof of the concept, preliminary result, but not a lot because um, this is new things. You, you are going to do that, just related to that, right? And also I got uh, feedback from different groups and practice, practice, practice. That really helped. Also, I got a private service and I present my presentation 
uh, to get feedback because um, they 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 had experiences and then they could give feedback about the um, standard uh, presentation. I prepare also a list of the question through the feedback I got. And also I expect some question by reading my proposal. So, and also I, I am aware of the about some weakness and I prepare myself for those questions. So when I had interview, I tried to get panel member interested in me and what I am doing, showing that really I'm expert, I know what I want to do, and I really like my research. I was concise and short as possible in my answer. So because panel want to see and that, that this idea is my idea, not other, and I am expert in this field, that's why it's really important. And also I show my CV through the presentation by showing that, okay, in my previous uh, publication, I did this building on that, I am going to do this. And it is normal, of course, to be nervous, but you should try to control it. And then um, concerning my question, I received 80 to 90 of question that I expected through the feedback I got from different groups. And also I expected something I received technically in-depth questions, and I got also a question actually, it's composed of three parts, and I have a paper to note and write down all keywords because I may miss, you know, because there are a lot of uh, questions after each other. So I would like also to share with you some sources I have used. Um, I use FFG Proto that, uh, Previous ERC awardee uh, provided generously this um, they they uh, proposal some B one or P two or abstract or all it was very useful to see that that uh, how other people uh, wrote the idea and that's really useful and also I checked the frequency asked question in ERC portal because that's help you also and answer some of your question and see the tricky point also. I check also some web like many ERC awardee um, in their own web like website, they share the experiences, that's really important. For example, I like know that research um, uh, group leader, he really honestly share his experiences, like my personal story to obtain an ERC, seven submission, four interviews, and six, six um, heartbreaks. Or for example, Sadat Nizamukli, Nizamuklu, he really present, he provide a PowerPoint presentation and he explained each stages and was very useful, of course, for me. And at the end, my last tip and words for you, be brave, you are right person for this idea and this proposal you're going to write. Start to write your ideas. Write your ideas every day and revise it and thinking about that. Talk with your, the, uh, the expert in your food and get feedback. That's really important. And cover the state of the art carefully. Check all pub recent publication concerning your idea. Think about the risk and feasibility and try to manage it. And at the end, believe in yourself and your ideas. And I hope that you enjoy the process and I wish you good luck. And uh, don't forget get, forget this creative idea have no limit. So thank you very much for your attention. I'm happy to get any question you have. Please uh, either raise your hands or, or put questions into the chat. Um, As a matter of interest, uh, do, how long did it take you to actually put the, the entire application together? Um, I started, I think, in advance, I think, in six months mm -hmm. and give myself to, to, to write ideas and really put together. But last three months was really intensive. Uh, was really like, like every day working and writing and trashing <laughs> <laughs> together.
Yeah. I can't see any hands up and we don't have any uh, questions more in the chat at the moment, but please do keep them coming through. Um, we'll have a big question and answer session at the end. Um, Gusama, am I saying your name correctly? That was close. It's it's more like um, it's more like Gotham from Batman's from from Gotham City from Batman. Gotham. Awesome. Okay, I'm so sorry. That's fine. No worries. Um, yeah. Why, why don't I go? Uh, you know, it, there'll be some overlap anyway, and then it gives people some time to think of questions. So you know, we can just do it afterwards, and I'll I'll be quick. Um, okay. So, is this in full screen mode and visible? It is now in full screen, yes. Cool, great, thanks. Um, so just a couple of, uh, I think it's all kind of life scientists here, but probably from a very broad range of um, backgrounds even within that space. So I just a couple of words of context about what my lab does because that would inform the way I think about this um, particular uh, 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 grant structure. And so we, in general, we study the process of cell division. We're cell biologists. Um, I've been a group leader at EMBL in Heidelberg um, since 2021. Um, I received an ERC starting grant in uh, 2022. And we study cell division, which of course interests many, many people, many, many cell biologists around the world. But we do this particularly from the point of view of evolution, because we're interested in diversity, in why different species have evolved different ways to carry out this very fundamental process, um, and whether there are fundamental rules that underlie this. Um, and whether uh, and, and if we can understand why different species evolve different strategies to divide. So this is our, our general research area. And in order to answer these sorts of questions, we have to be quite diverse technically. Um, we do a lot of microscopy of different kinds. Um, we do a lot of comparative genomics um, to anchor our findings in different model systems and non-model systems. Um, we do field sampling. Um, so we, we are interested in, in obtaining protists um, uh, directly from environmental samples uh, for experiments. And we also do experimental evolution in the lab to try to understand um, evolutionary processes uh, within cells on, on shorter time frames. So we're talking about a few hundred generations, not, not billions of years. But this is the context um, in which my lab works and the context in which we had already started to work um, the year I applied for, for, the, for the starting grant. And so <clears throat> actually sort of general advice um, has been very well covered uh, just before me in this breakout session, but also I think overall um, in, in the first two talks of the event. So actually what I'm gonna point out here are just a couple of extra things that really struck me only in retrospect. So, so I think um, in talking to other colleagues who are applying in subsequent years, I think I've distilled these down into just a few things that seem to be really important. All the other stuff is also important, but, but you probably already know it. And some of this is probably obvious too, but I'll just go through it anyway. So in this planning phase, when you're thinking about writing this grant, um, some of this is just pragmatic. So basically, if it's your last chance to apply, of course, you should do it. But if it is not your last chance to apply, you should think very carefully about whether if you've already started a lab, you actually um, have some data to, to back up some of, of your claims because people on the panel and, and expert reviewers will actually be quite keen on seeing it if it exists. Um, it's probably a good idea actually to write down some version of your ideas long before you're actually drafting the grant, just because as soon as you put them down on paper, you will probably realize that the first version of them are not very good. Um, and uh, and uh, you have to go through a few iterations of this before it starts to make sense. Um, and if you do have multiple chances ahead, which is a very nice position to be in, so multiple years until the seven year deadline, um, then I, it's better to actually run your initial ideas past your colleagues even before writing down a word just to see if people think, especially more senior experienced colleagues, think that you are sort of on track to deliver the best grant that you could, because if not, maybe you should wait a cycle, um, even if this brings down your number of cycles to two or, or even one. So you should think very carefully, because if you submit a subpar grant, subpar by your own standards, um, chances are that it will not get favorably reviewed and you might even get blacklisted from applying the following year. So you 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 should be careful about this. Um, panel choice is super important. This was just mentioned. Um, in addition to panel choice being really important, there is the possibility to submit cross panel. I did this, it was a mistake. Um, there's almost no winning situation for this cross panel thing because what will happen is that first, there is a huge danger that your grant falls between the cracks because 
panel A and panel B are both feeling kind of meh about it and neither of them really wants to take it onto their panel um, and, uh, and, and take it as a primary. So then you can just sort of get lost even with a really good proposal. That's too interdisciplinary in a way for the ERC. Um, the other problem is that a panel might choose you. So I submitted to LS3 and LS8 and LS3 decided to take me to step two. But when, the, when you submit cross panel, they have to ask at least one reviewer and one panel member from the other panel to evaluate your proposal. And the only bad review I got in the end out of 11 was the one from LS8 because my proposal wasn't evolutionary enough um, for, for LS8 and I already knew this. And so in the end, it didn't hurt me that much, but it was not helpful at all. Um, it was actually kind of a mistake. So I would really say, if you can at all avoid it, avoid it. Do not apply cross panel. Um, it will just cause you trouble. Um, the most important thing, all the details can follow afterwards, is that you have a big idea that can really permeate the entire grant. Um, and how you come to this is totally individual. We just heard from Sore how she sort of thought about how to synthesize her research experiences and field into something exciting. Maybe you've had this big idea since you were a kid and you just really want to do it. And this is unlikely, but you know, maybe. Um, but the most important things are here on the tech in on the slide. So can you describe this to somebody who's just a colleague, but a scientist, but uh, a life scientist, but not, not a specialist. And if it's too easily, you think fundable from your own national agencies, forget it. The ERC is never going to fund it. Um, as soon as they sense that it's something that they don't need to support, um, they will put their resources elsewhere. And related, basically, they want to fund research that is going to be transformative, not transformative necessarily that it changes the course of human history. That's obviously asking for too much, but transformative in terms of changing the way that people do science in your subfield. And if so, this is this is a winning grant for them to support. And from that perspective, putting 1.5 million into something that changes the course of a field is a big win for them, right? So, so the question is, is this a big idea? Of course, that something that might fail, the fact that it might fail mean that your national agencies might be not super into it. So is that a good candidate then for the ERC? It's also important, not true for Synergy or other European funding schemes, but for this starting grant and consolidated and so on, it's actually quite important that you basically are able to do the almost the entire grant by yourself. Collaborators are very welcome, but they can only be collaborators that help out with specific things. If your grant relies on a collaboration or relies on expertise from somewhere else, you're not going to get it. Um, so this is really a grant that's awarded to you and your team um, to carry out um, research, which is related to the last point. Question is, could anybody do your grant? Because if so, chances are that other people are A, already trying to do it, and also B, um, it raises questions with the panel as to whether um, it makes sense to support you if you're going to be competing um, with lots of people who are going to take the same approach. So it also needs to be somehow related um, to your unique expertise, and this will also make it easier for you to write. So when you get to the writing phase, um, this also Sarah covered, like for the B1, it has to be a standalone doc because the panel will only see B2 later. Um, and um, you need to get, therefore, non-specialist feedback on the B1 because it should be comprehensible to generalists. Um, the CV section thing has changed. So for this, I think both of us are not maybe that useful. Uh, or at least I didn't have it, um, maybe sort of did. Um, and so I think this new format is actually much better for highlighting people's achievements, independent of impact factor or whatever. Um, and then the B2 is the hardest part. I found it really miserable to write because it was like, I really wrote a five page thing, which I was quite happy with. And then I have to write a 15 page thing, which is gonna be worse because as soon as you make something longer, it's worse in terms of quality of writing usually. Um, but, it's also very frustrating because it, it cannot just be an extension, not because anybody's upset about self-plagiarism, but rather that your written referees, uh, remote referees and the panel will be stuck with both of these documents and it'll be very annoying to them if they open them and have to figure out like what is even different between these two. So just somehow find a way to write it separately. Later, you need to coordinate to make sure that it all makes sense but write it separately. Some people write the B1 first and then the B2 or the other way around. I mean, I think this depends on you. But this is much more about details of implementation and feasibility because these are experts in your field, many. It's kind of shocking how many reviews you get back in the end. Um, and try not to be too cute with the formatting because obviously there are no rules. 
So people will do funny things like I've reviewed now a couple of brands and it's very frustrating. Like they'll make too many boxes and colors and try to squeeze like little text into the corners. And, you know, of course it all fits 15 pages, but it's not much worth 50, fitting 15 pages if then you annoy everybody that's trying to read it because it's impossible to read. So I think it's much more important to, to use figures, schematics uh, smartly, try to make it readable. Um, um, and so that somebody who's reviewing it can do so quickly and get to the point quickly. And in the B2, don't send it to the same people as you sent your B1 to. That will also annoy them because they won't have time to help you so much. But send it to other colleagues that are more in your subfield um, that will be able to give you really specialist feedback and be very mean about it. Friends that can be very mean about it um, will basically say this experiment is completely useless. It will never work um, or you know, do something else in a different way. Okay, um, I just wanted to, I, I, made, uh, I didn't make this point, I wanted to make this point that for the B1, I got a lot of feedback from people while I was practicing, and it was also even mentioned in my written evaluation afterwards as a positive thing, so I wanted to share it, and that was that it can be really helpful to have a guiding schematic that's in your B1, maybe in the B2, and also in your interview slides, um, and this was you don't have to worry about the details. It doesn't make sense, right, to you, obviously. But this is the schematic from my grant. And I was able to bring it back um, throughout the interview process. And it really helped, I think, because people had it in front of them. They could quickly remember what I was talking about. And it was a kind of visual summary of the whole thing. So if you can find a way to do this for your grant, um, it's probably helpful. Um, for the interview, uh, the slides are really important because it's the only chance you have to convince the rest of the panel, other than the two people that have read your grant very carefully, that your stuff is interesting. And you really want this because in the discussion afterwards, if they found your talk interesting and they found the discussion interesting, then they will weigh in with support if one of your two or both of your two uh, uh, readers basically put forward your grant for for. For, for funding. So they basically say, they say, we read this, it's great. And then if the rest of the panel got really bored in the interview, then they're not going to feel super, you know, positive about supporting um, your, your, your grant in the discussion. So you really, this is your chance to catch them. They would not have read the thing carefully. They've probably just seen the abstract, maybe glanced at the figure. They have no idea what you do or where you're from or what your, what your work is about. So this, these slides are really important. Um, I think more than anything else, more than actually writing the grant, more than anything, more than the practices I had to do. I think I, I was just looking today earlier just to take these screenshots for this talk. And I, in the end, the version of the slides that I used for my interview was version seven. Um, so for a seven minutes presentation, that's a lot of versions, right? Um, because the feedback I got was brutal. This is too long. That's too complicated. This figure is not nice. Nobody will know what they're talking about. It's very difficult. It's very difficult. So please spend a lot of time on this um, and, and don't try not to leave anybody on the panel uh, behind. Um, I got some advice to use my cover slide because you get a cover slide, right? Because when you first share your screen, they're going to be staring at something on, in their big uh, uh, room in Brussels. Um, so I basically put the title and, the, and the, the kind of key features of the grant already on the title slide. I didn't say anything about it. I just put it there so that they could see it. Um, and then I think it's really important to end the presentation, not with like some detail of, of, of work package six of your thing, but rather to bring it back to the high level so that when the questioning starts, it starts at this level that you want it to be, which is kind of like overview of the, of the grant. So that's just what my slides look like. You can see that schematic came back again. And then the last thing is about the practice. Um, rehearse quite a lot until you have reached the point that basically you're get, you've circled a full circle in feedback and people are telling you to change things that you already changed in response to the first round of feedback away from what it was. So basically once you've reached the point that people are giving you contradictory feedback, which will happen, stop rehearsing, and then just relax, go do your other work and wait for your interview. Uh, but the initial practice rounds are very important. And especially if you can get access to senior colleagues that um, have been on ERC panels themselves or at least have received ERC funding, um, and people outside your field. Look at the panel from two years ago, not to stress out, but just to think about it, um, just to try to understand, uh, yeah, try to understand what kind of fields they come from. They may not be the same people, but there will be some overlap. And um, this is very hard for many people, myself included, 
practice really short, precise answers. They have many questions to ask you. If you ramble or you're like, oh, let me think about that, that's super interesting. They will actually cut you off because they have a list of questions to get through. It is in your benefit for them to get through as many as they can. So don't like for things that require very precise answers that are hard to answer precisely, like what is your career plan in 10 years or what do you hope to have achieved at the end of the grant? Prepare answers beforehand for questions that are about the science of the grant. Be very precise. They say, will this work? You say, yes, it will because this. And if it doesn't work, we'll try that. And you know, if not, then we also do this. Thanks for your question. Next question. And then always bring it back to the science. They will start to ask you some logistical stuff, really annoying, like what will postdoc one do? What will graduate student two do? Uh, who are your competitors? I mean, answer the question and then bring it back to the science. So say, you know, postdoc two is going to do this, which we think is really exciting because of what you asked before, because these are scientists in the panel. They're doing full days, three full days of interviews. If you're unlucky like I was, you will be 5 p.m. on the last day. Um, they are exhausted. And at the end of the day, the only thing that interests science is science. Uh, scientists is science. So they don't want to talk about funding. They don't want to talk about how much money you ask for for a microscope. They don't care about these things. They just want to be excited about what you're doing. So if they ask you logistical questions, bring them back to the science. The more your interview spends on science, the more likely you are to get the grant, I think. Okay, that's it. And then the last thing I just wanted to say is that if it's possible at all um, to do this, to have fun while writing a grant, um, uh, if any grant is possible to have fun with, this is the one because this is about the science that, that you always dreamed of doing and doing it the way that you know it should be done. And the ERC does give you the freedom at least to present those ideas to them. And then if you're lucky, um, they give you the money also. Okay, so that's that. And hopefully we still have time for a few questions for, for, both, uh, for both of us yeah, or anyone. Yeah, yeah we do have time. Um... Thank you very much. That was really, really great. Both of you, really wonderful. Um, if anyone does have any uh, questions, please just say, please put up your hands or uh, write them in the chat. Uh, Gotham is it's also a small, it's also a small group. So if you want to just turn on your camera. Or... Yeah, yeah, exactly. Put up your hands. We're happy that people can chat for themselves. Um, you were saying that you reviewed some grants. Is there a sort of typical things that you find uh, people don't, Apart from you know trying to squeeze everything into the B two as you were saying, are there things that you find uh, annoying, difficult? Um, I think it's a really difficult grant to review, partly because you know how much is riding on it for people's careers, so you you want to be like really 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 careful to to do a good job. Um, but those are not the candidate's fault. That's just the format. It's difficult because there's a lot of detail and you have to dig into the references and things like that. I think what can really help. I re the 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 B two reviewers is is um, really really laying out like really laying out the experiments or analyses or whatever and backup plans and sort of direct impact of each of the kind of modular sub aims very well because the overall picture is easier to get from the B one so you'll probably as a reviewer, glance at that first, figure out what they're planning. Um, and then the B2, you know, detailed background stuff is a little less important. And uh, what's really important is getting quickly to the heart of what they're actually going to do. And if it's very hard to understand what they're actually going to do, the chances are you'll get badly reviewed because it will just seem a bit impractical. Um, because it's like, oh, you know, why, why are they being so vague? At this point, you want to be very precise. So the, the B2 needs to be yeah, it should be as if you're presenting in a way like a plan to your own department, basically, where you basically would be really careful about being precise about stuff that you're actually going to do. But that, but that's that. I mean, I don't know what's going to happen with the with the grants I reviewed, so we'll we'll see. <laughs> All right, we're still. Uh... Waiting on you guys for for any questions and things, and please do please do put up your hands, even if you have a a anything brewing in the back of your brain. Um, please don't be shy. Um, we're a very friendly crowd, and these are two experts. We also have uh, Yanka, and I'm probably saying that incorrectly. I'm so sorry from the um, ERC here as well. Um, and Gotham has said that you can reach out to him specifically, uh, and given his email address, and that's very kind. Uh, thank you. So. 
I was uh, wondering about your budget, forming the budget. So um, obviously there's, there's an amount that you can apply for. Did you guys find that difficult? Did you have to compromise your, your science versus getting more people in your lab? How did you find um, budgeting? Yeah, okay. Um, so for me, I mean, um, also, I think if in biology is really difficult because it's really expensive, actually, to do all lab work and thing. And what I did, actually, I got agreement with my host that if I get ERC, help me in this and this. And I wrote, actually, in budget, that this part will cover by host. Otherwise, I can't really justify, actually. And also the task, you know, how many PhD postdoc who... Uh, does what is not really easy, of course, task, because you write a big, you know, as um, also Gauta say that it's big, right? And then big things need a lot of people, big team, but you, you have a limitation of the finance, then you need really to justify it carefully. That's not easy task, to be honest. Maybe you said that about your, your experiences, Gauta? Yeah, I mean, I think that's really great response. It's, it's it, well, there's two levels to it. So first of all, it's really difficult to do if you have in your institution or future institution a budgeting officer who can really help with it. This helps a lot because some of the stuff is not up for discussion. How much does a postdoc cost at my institution? I mean, I don't know. I didn't know before I applied, right? So, so I think you need help. Um, so don't hesitate to ask for it from the people that are going to in the end benefit from your grant because they're going to take the overheads. So um, they owe you the help anyway. Um, but the other answer is yes, it's, it is really hard. In retrospect, I actually probably miscosted my grant and should have asked for one less or half less person and more money for um, consumables because actually now we are struggling with, with that um, um, because sometimes... It can work out that way that maybe personnel you get elsewhere because they get their own fellowships or something. And then you have this money for people, but you don't have money to actually support their research effectively. So it can be difficult and it's hard to know in advance. Um, but at the end of the day, maybe the easiest way is to let first shape your proposal first, then realistically think about what could be managed by people. And if your own salary is involved, then you have to also, of course, budget for the fact that you will be you're really taking a chunk of the of the grants resources and therefore have to have to manage it in this way um and then try to assign it because it can happen that if this is unrealistic then a lot of questions from the reviewers or in interview could be about this because they say this is a wonderful idea but you want to do it all with two phd students i mean not going to happen um so it is hard uh and here also senior colleagues are probably very valuable because they can tell you because we're all starting group leaders or future group leaders. And so we have absolutely no idea actually how much it can take or how many people it really needs. So I think this can also really you benefit from, from uh, expert input. Yeah. Thank you, both of you. Um, I guess is that we've got a few more minutes. Is that please any questions? Um, Perhaps, uh, Philippa, may I just because I see that there is a uh, time left. Um, yes, um, I would really like to thank you for uh, both uh, the grantees who presented the research here and, and how they applied to the ERC. I think it was an excellent uh, overview with really very important and useful tips and tricks and observations. And I just would actually like to give one comment and I have a question. Um, one is that we are really working hard on solving the issue and observe the disaster that you have described, uh, Gotham, on uh, this cross-panel feature. And uh, so we noticed that. And um, of course, you are perfectly right. Uh, in order to succeed, um, perhaps now the best advice is indeed to minimize that or even to avoid. This is not always obvious. And I would really much like to emphasize that we do uh, appreciate and welcome and try to fund uh, interdisciplinary complex proposals. But I understand that this is something that uh, our uh, up, uh, um, applicants, the grantees, notice that uh, there might be some difficulties with this uh, type of uh, cross-panel feature uh, grants. Uh, so this is just what I would like to tell you, that we acknowledge the difficulty there and we are really working hard on, on finding solutions uh, not to deter applicants with such ideas and such grants. 
And the second is actually a question because you uh, elaborated really um, in great detail on the part B1 and part B2, and this was excellent. And this is really the strategy that we also advise and, and have in mind. And, and I think this could optimize the, the chance for success. Uh, recently, we are uh, brainstorming in whether is this uh, structure the best way to apply uh, in terms of, of the documents. Do you, for example, in, uh, thought of uh, what uh, would it mean to you as applicants um, to have one single document instead of this part B1 and part B2? Would you, for example, prefer such form of application? Let's say one single document of instead of five pages, like now you have the CV part and then a 10 pages proposal and that's it. What, what would you think about that? How would you take that instead of the, the current structure that we have now with these two parts? Okay. It's just to, because we have the time now. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, sorry, do you want to go? Okay. Um, I, so first, <laughs> th thanks very much for the comment. And it's, it's very good to hear that the, the ERC is also thinking about how to make the cross panel thing work better, because I think that would be indeed wonderful, because many people's proposals are truly um, cross uh, panel. Um, so, of course, I it's very it's very easy to criticize and very hard to come up with a better solution. So I hesitate to say that I have a really good idea for how to do this. Um, I was curious about whether somehow the B1 and B2 split could remain, but rather than requiring the B2 to be a standalone document, it could be focused entirely on implementation and outcomes um, and not require also yet another background and impact statement, you know, basically, because right now it's, it's, it's really a full grant, right? Like the B2 could in theory be read as a completely independent document. Mm -hmm. But since no one really does that, they always have the B1 to also glance at. I was wondering whether it could be partitioned in such a way that they're actually non-overlapping, but still panel doesn't see uh, B2 until later and all of that stuff. Um, yeah. Okay. That, you know, Thank you, that Thank you for this very valuable input, yes. We have a question from Mei Chi, um, who asks, uh, or says, thank you very much to both of you, um, but asks um, if you could elaborate more on the reason that somebody is the right person for a project. Who wants to take this? Okay, sorry, do you wanna, yeah. Mm -hmm. So to, to say that you are right person for your project, you should check that your what you did in the past, right? For example, in my case, for example, I work with a stem cell, meaning that I can do the part work package that I want to do with the stem cell methodology. I have a, a publication. This all um, proved the the idea this that that I am expert on that. You know, like like any anything that that you show that or I don't know like um, any 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 technology for example you apply your patent that for example and they you want to show that you have done something and you are expert on that just just with this such a such evidence could prove that i hope that that answers question. maybe uh, if you have a more outcome yeah i um yes i mean so first of all i mean just by definition right like it's it's your Everybody does have a unique scientific trajectory and, and therefore clearly this is coming from, from you. And, and But I think highlighting that for, for panel and reviewers is not always the easiest thing. So, so you need to find the best way to do it. It can be that your proposal is truly representing a synthesis of your, your past expertise. It could be a combination of your past expertise with your current institution. Um, the fact that these have come together or future institution um, allow you to do something that was truly not possible. Um, it could be that it requires kind of a jump, uh, like a high risk sort of approach that that is um, not easily taken in other contexts. So basically try to take as many pieces of evidence from your environment, your history, um, the proposal to basically say, um, like in all honesty, without just boasting, like truly, if you want this work to be done and you think it's exciting, then I'm the person to do it. Um, and I think that that's how you have to approach it. Thank you both. We have uh, another question here from 
Uh, so I'm, by the way, I'm so sorry. I'm probably pronouncing everyone's names incorrectly, and I I'm to blame dyslexia. But honestly, I'm just terrific. I'm so sorry if I'm mangling your name. Um, is it necessary that you are the lead author of publications that contain the major methods that we base our ERC proposal on, or methods we adopt from co-author papers, um, or to equally count in justifying our ability to use it for the proposed project? I mean, just very quickly, I would say, no, it's not necessary that you're a lead author. You just need to demonstrate that you or your people will have an easy access to the expertise required if you don't already have it. Um, and if you're a co-author on a paper, the assumption will be that you at least understood what was going on. So you can probably do it. Uh, great, thank you. Um, if there are any other questions, please put them um, in the chat. Um, we're at time right now, but we did start a little a little late, so we can go over for a few minutes um, if there are any other questions. Um, just while we're here, I just wondered if either of you had um, any thoughts on the importance of um, people who um, uh, write letters of support or, or your collaborators. Do you have any thoughts on, on how you've actually picked those to be you know, really great for your actual project? Sorry. Do you mean that to, to choose the collaborators? Um, well, you should aware of your project, right? And then you aware of the what a collaborator give benefit. And if you have a you demonstrate also already the collaboration, then it would be really great. But um, also at, as Gautam said that you should not really put a lot or so load on the collaborator because this is your personal project and you should be able to do most of the thing. But of course, it's also important to write your collaborators. And as I told you, that's showing that you have a collaboration and you could recognize nationally or internationally. For me, even I got, for example, from one referee that say that, okay, the applicant has also in this part have enough collaborator to 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 manage this part. Even I got I got such a such a feedback. Meaning also is really important to show that, but also you need to to control this this aspect that this is your personal grant and it's for you, not for your collaborator. Yeah, exactly. That's exactly right. Um, I just one other thing to add. Um, probably it's a bit suboptimal if all your collaborators are easily guessed to be all your postdoc advisors, collaborators, or PhD advisors, collaborators, because that will suggest very strongly that actually you're not as independent as, as you claim. Um, so just keep it in mind that ideally these are, in a way, relationships also that you are building yourself for your future career that will also give the panel confidence that, that you know what you're doing. Great, thank you. Um... Yanka, can you um, potentially uh, reply to Simona? Yes. Asked, I, I'm like typing. Best with interdisciplinary <laughs> projects. As yes, it is indeed. Better to choose one panel uh, than two. Yes, I have seen. I and I started to type my answer. So it's hard to give a bulletproof advice, right? Because at the end, it's your idea, it's your project, it's your dream, it's your chance to to win a grant. And we do have interdisciplinary proposals which which get funded. So I cannot say that uh, interdisciplinary proposals uh, fail. This this would be a, a wrong message to send. Um, but they are more complex indeed, and they succeed probably uh, less uh, than others. Um, if anybody's interested, we can actually uh, go into the figures. Uh, there are publicly available data on that. Um, but um, so what I would say is, if you think that your scientific idea, the very essence of it, does not suffer from focusing it into one uh, panel, perhaps, and I'm carefully suggesting this, but perhaps this would be a good strategy to follow. But again, I would like to highlight, it is really the scientific idea that has to be there. And I would not, with all my heart, recommend something that would reduce the value of that scientific idea. So yeah, this is the gambling and the balance that is all over in applying uh, for an ERC grant. You have multiple balances to 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 find when you write and then the interviews and all that thing. And it's, these are delicate decisions. I, I, I would like to highlight that. 
thank you very much. Um, we have one uh, question from Sebastian, uh, who uh, asks. Oh, thanks the the presenters uh, very kindly for their for their contributions, and then asks whether continuing PhD students are eligible to apply to the for the grant. I'm not sure I get the question correctly. What does that I think, mean? I think, as far as I, again, maybe Yanka, a better place to answer. But as far as I know, you you have to have defended your PhD to be. Yes, correct. It yeah. is, and we actually the the eligibility window for the starting grant is two to uh, five uh, years. Two to seven. Seven. Two to seven. You are uh, sorry. <laughs> yes. <laughs> two to seven. I'm sorry. Yes, and then seven to twelve. Yeah, I'm sorry. Two to seven. Yes. Correct. So you you even need to wait uh, two years. Is the defense of your PhD that uh, starts the clock? Um, sorry, Philippa. Thanks for coordinating and everyone for your questions. I, I have to actually run to another thing. I hope it's okay. Absolutely no. Thank you. I'm just about to wrap up. So uh, thank you everybody for joining today. I'm sure that you'd wish to um, join me in thanking our two brilliant presenters. Um, they've both supplied their emails in the chat. So if you do have any questions for them, please do um, uh, email them. Um, but thank you both. You are amazing. Um, incredible information and, and hugely uh, supportive of people. So I will let you go now. Thank you, everybody, for attending. <laughs> thank you, Philippa. Thank, thank you, you so all. much. And good luck, all applicants, for application. Yes. Bye. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye-bye. Yeah.